everybody, and thank you so much for joining us uh, today. My name is Barbara Alvarado, and I'm the chair of the Society of American Archivist Student Chapter for San Jose State University. Uh, we're super excited about our presentation this evening because uh, we have one of our alumni. Um, so before we get started, we are going to go over some quick housekeeping rules. Um, so please uh, feel free to include any questions that you may have uh, for our presenter in the chat. We monitor that uh, throughout the entire presentation. So feel free to just put your questions in there. Um, please make sure to keep your camera off uh, to stay muted. Um, and just as an FYI, uh, we are going to include a link to a document uh, that has all of our social media handles as well as um, our presenters organization uh, website and their social media handles in case you uh, would like to follow either uh, to learn more about both. Again, please feel free to add your questions in the chat. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our chair, Jenny Galipo. Great. Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Galipo. Um, and I am excited to introduce our guest speaker tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the introduction slide here. So tonight we have Jennifer Thompson, who is the records analyst and archivist in the J. Paul Getty Trust Institutional Records and Archives Department. Jennifer joined the department in 2004 and has served in various administrative records management and archive roles. She is currently the Trust Administration Records and Archives Liaison and Getty Information Management Specialist. Jennifer holds a BA in Anthropology and South Asian Studies from USC Santa Cruz and an MA in International Relations from San Francisco State University and an MLIS from San Jose State University the class of 2015. She's an active SAA member and her last contribution to the organization was managing the production of the 2021 annual meeting virtual repository tours as a member of the 2021 host committee. So now I will pass the mic over to our guest speaker, Jennifer. And uh, we'll start the presentation. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you, Jenny, for that nice um, introduction. And let me share my screen with y'all. So everyone can see this, I hope. Yes, good, okay. Um, so here we go. So I want to welcome everybody to the J. Paul Getty Trust Institutional Records and Archives Overview um, that I'm presenting to San Jose State University SAA student chapter tonight. Thanks for all coming out at 6.30 on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, this picture, you just saw this picture of me before, but here it is again. Um, and here I am, uh, this picture is in my office, which we were recently able to return to work in September after being um, out working from home for about um, just about 18 months. Um, so lots of fun and exciting things uh, <laughs> awaited me when I returned. Um, and here on the right is just one of my favorite artworks from the museum collection. It's called uh, A Hair in the Forest. And I've scattered um, some images of Getty artworks throughout the presentation, um, as well as just some pictures um, that I've also taken. And um, those ones, uh, the ones I've taken, I have not credited. So just a little more about me. Um, there was a brief intro in the intro uh, that Jenny gave, um, but I have been at the Getty since 2004. My previous work experience uh, had been in administrative assistant roles. So way back in 2004, I was looking around for a new job and I was just applying for any admin assistant jobs um, I could find regardless of the industry. Uh, so Getty happened to have an opening in institutional records and archives. So I applied for that and I got the job. 
I didn't have an MILS, M-L-I-S, uh, and I didn't have any kind of library or archives training whatsoever. I just had a BA in anthropology and MA in international relations. So I was an admin assistant there for about two years, then promoted to records coordinator, which was the junior information management position. And then another few years went by and staff left and I moved into the records analyst position. And at the time, those who had left were the information management specialists. So I was called upon to fill those shoes as well. In 2008, I started the MLIS program at San Jose State. And I was on the one course a semester for a seven year schedule uh, because I was also working full time and taking care of my family. So um, yeah, that's all I could manage, one, one, uh, one course a semester. So uh, meanwhile, in 2014, my job duties uh, came to encompass archives as well. And my new title became Archivist Records Manager. So um, I came into this career just almost completely by accident. It was just by virtue of me getting this admin assistant job way back in 2004. Um, and pretty much everything that I've learned uh, about my uh, disciplines, I've learned it through on-the-job experience. Um, I did, of course, get the MLIS, and I learned a lot in that program. And I'm also really glad that I did that because, obviously, it's um, something you want to have on your resume. So I have three topics that I'm gonna talk to you all about tonight. So the first is our J. Paul Getty Trust institutional history. And then I'm gonna talk about uh, our institutional records and archives program, who our patrons are, um, how we decide what gets to live in our institutional archives. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the day-to-day -day work of our department. So institutional history. So uh, these images are our founder, Mr. John Paul Getty. The one on the left is obviously a photograph and the one on the right is a portrait. And I just think these two are interesting to put next to each other because obviously the photograph was uh, copied to make this, this portrait here. Um, so Mr. Getty made his fortune in the oil business. He founded and uh, ran the company Getty Oil. And he started collecting art in the late 1930s. And in 1953, he uh, established the J. Paul Getty Museum as a nonprofit and tax exempt charitable trust to oversee his art collections. So the museum was opened in 1954 in a section of Mr. Getty's home, which is the, uh, called the Ranch House, located in Malibu, California, which is this black and white image on the left. Uh, so fast forward to the early 70s, uh, and the size of the collections had grown considerably, and also the amount of museum visitors were becoming too much to handle uh, for this building, which was also um, his personal residence at the time. So a new museum building, which is the one you see on the right-hand side, was built, and this is a recreation of the Villa dei Papyri in Herculaneum, Italy. Uh, both the original villa and both also the city of Herculaneum, they were all destroyed when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD along with Pompeii. So if you were visited there today, you would see the ruins of the real Villa dei Papyri and the Getty Villa is a um, pretty true to life copy of what it did look like. So. Mr. Getty dies in 1976, and he leaves the vast bulk of his estate, which at that time was about worth $700 million, to the Museum Trust with the mandate to provide for the, quote, diffusion of artistic and general knowledge. And this is an exact quote of his wishes that appears in his will. In 1982, the Museum Trust receives two distributions from his estate, totaling $1.1 billion. And then in the early 80s, um, Mr. Getty's company, Getty Oil, was involved in litigation. Um, it's the Texoil versus Pennzoil um, case. And the outcome of that case resulted in the sale of his company and the settlement due um, to Museum Trust pushed up the endowment value to about $2.3 billion. 
So um, the trust is legally required to spend four and a, and a quarter percent of the endowment's average market value in three out of every four years. Um, and this is not including grants given to others. And they also have to follow the founder's wishes to diffuse artistic knowledge, which is what he stated in his will. And it's a legal obligation that that needs to be followed as well. So how to spend all of this money. So the trustees decided to create uh, an international cultural and philanthropic institution. And this was going to provide opportunities to preserve, share, study, and conserve the world's artistic and cultural heritage. So they did this by envisioning an institution that would have a foundational impact on the visual arts and humanities, something that was a lot bigger and just more transformational than what a museum could do alone. So out of this vision grew the idea to bring together different areas of the visual arts including scholarship, conservation, and education as separate but co-equal partners in a single um, arts and cultural heritage institution. So thus was born what we refer to today as the programs. Uh, and currently, um, these are known as the Getty Conservation Institute, the Getty Foundation, the Getty Research Institute, which is the program that I am a part of, um, and also the museum obviously still exists. And that was expanded considerably when uh, all of this, when they came into all of this money. And so concurrently to planning how they were going to expand um, the trust, it was decided that um, they were gonna construct a major new facility in Los Angeles to house the museum and the programs all in one place, uh, because what did exist at the time was sort of scattered all over the place and there's the Villa Museum in Malibu. Um, so uh, Richard Meyer and Partners was selected as the architect for that. And this photo here on the right shows the uh, plot of land in Brentwood that was acquired uh, to build a facility on in 1985. And um, if you're familiar with Los Angeles, you can sort of see there in the background, that's the Sepulveda Pass in the 405. So in 1983, the J. Paul Getty uh, Museum Trust becomes the J. Paul Getty Trust. And this is just um, a, a legal change that is going to accommodate all of these new programs. Uh, so meanwhile, construction of the center is going on. And this photo uh, on the right-hand side is the nearly completed Hilltop Center in 1996. Uh, it would be finished and open to the public in December, 1997. So the original villa um, that is now, it's actually located, physically located in Pacific Palisades. Um, it didn't actually move. Uh, the boundaries of the city were redrawn and Malibu is now just outside um, the Pacific Palisades um, city limits. So the villa is um, slated to become a museum solely for the uh, antiquities collections. So as for the institutional archives, uh, our department got its start in the early 2000s. Um, and the way that happened is the vice president of administration at the time, um, who had also been the director of the building program who was in charge of um, building the center. He decided that he, uh, it was really important for Getty's early history to be preserved um, as archives. So he made that recommendation and um, here we are today. We are a uh, fully functioning um, department, uh, independent department with a mandate to um, collect and preserve enduring uh, records of uh, historical value. So now moving on to part two, our institutional records and archives program. So <clears throat> just a quick definition of institutional archives uh, before I move forward. Um, so institutional archives uh, exist to collect and preserve the information of the organization that it is representing. So in a lot of organizations, um, there is an institutional archives and this exists alongside a special collections. And this is also the case at the Getty. Um, the Research Institute has a uh, special collections unit. 
We are two separate departments uh, reporting to the same administrative unit, which is the research library. And even though we are both archives, uh, we use the same materials and the same uh, methods, our collecting mandates are very different. Uh, our subject is, J is solely uh, the J. Paul Getty Trust and special collections is the history of art in general. So to give an example of how institutional archives operates, um, I'll use this photograph here that's called A Glimpse of Santa Cruz by photographer Carlton Watkins, and it's taken around uh, 1883. Santa Cruz sure doesn't look like that anymore. Um, so what institutional archives would collect about this particular object are the Getty records pertaining to deliberations about purchasing this object, documentation of the purchase, its care and maintenance once it arrived at the Getty, its exhibition history, and basically anything about this object's life here at the Getty. Versus special collections might collect something like the photographer's diaries or notes or personal archives, or even um, the actual photograph itself. Um, and this is in the Getty collection, although it's not in special collections, it is actually um, in, um, owned by the Department of Photographs in the museum. But I just like the photo. Um, so now a word about our patrons. In special collections, uh, materials are available to outside researchers, people who come from universities, other institutions, you know, school groups, individuals who wanna come and, and see these unique materials. So institutional archives patrons, um, at least at our institution, consists mostly at this time of Getty staff. And this is because the majority of materials that we collect are oops, the business records of the organization, and they are confidential, and they are currently restricted per our current access policy, which, now I go to this slide, is right here. So uh, here's a rundown of our access policy, um, and there's a couple of different tiers of access. Um, generally, only the department that created records the general counsel, the president's office, and the board of trustees have access to all restricted records. And actually, um, to put a finer point on that, departments have access to the records that it created or its previous iteration created. And it can grant access to other designees if it so wishes. So our first tier is permanently closed. Um, and includes records like board of trustee meeting minutes and legal communications and, you know, records that could compromise site security. Those are, you know, the public is never going to see those. The second tier is closed for 50 years after the latest inclusive date of each accession, and it includes records of executive officers and program director records. So our third tier is closed for 35 years after the latest inclusive accession date. And that includes curatorial, registrar and collection acquisition records. So the fourth tier is closed for 25 years after the last accession and includes all other business records. And we do have a fifth tier. Um, all records that are intended for public circulation are just immediately open. There's no restrictions whatsoever on those. So given the age of our institution, um, which is fairly young, comparatively young, uh, compared to a, a lot of museums, most records uh, are going to remain restricted for really for some time. Although our earlier collections uh, from the 70s and, you know, from the, the founding of the museum, those are starting to, to reach their trigger dates and we will be able to, to open those up. So what does institutional records and archives collect and how do we collect it? We collect Getty information. And Getty information is anything documenting work performed in support of Getty's mission, core functions, management, and operations. So what does that mean more specifically? So Getty information answers the questions who, what, when, where, how, and what is it? 
And I also want to point out um, that it is carrier agnostic. We always really want to make that point to everyone um, because it's still really not kind of universally recognized that, ele that electronic records are something of importance that we want to preserve for archives. So we say electronic records, electronic records, electronic records. And here on the right, this matrix is um, something that we publish in our training materials um, to help us and to help other users at the Getty ask themselves um, and, and got sort of guide their questions when they're deciding um, if a record they have is, um, you know, how, how important is it? And you can see here, it's like what happened, what was decided, what advice was given. These are all cues that are going to tell us that, yes, this is something that we need to take a closer look at and um, probably um, transfer into archives. So how do we collect Getty information? So we operate a dual discipline program of information management, which is also known as records management um, on the front end of our practice and our archives is on the back end. Our information management program helps us to identify and locate the materials that we want to permanently preserve in institutional archives. And it also allows us to recognize what we don't want so those materials aren't going to distract us um, from our finding what we want, and we can, you know, we can just get rid of them. We do all of our information and records management work in collaboration with the departments while their records are either still in situ in their offices or in some kind of uh, inactive storage situation. Our practice is governed by an information governance policy. And this policy states that the practice of information management ensures that Getty information is created, documented, maintained, and destroyed according to consistent principles. And here is um, on the right hand side is what that uh, policy looks like. So having this policy gives us um, both a mandate and it also provides us with our um, a set of basic working principles. So we can preserve our institutional history, which we formally do through Getty Institutional Archives. We can ensure that we're taking good care of Getty information assets by using appropriate stewardship methods. We're making sure that Getty complies with legal obligations and with best practices. And finally, um, protection. So Getty wants to avoid releasing confidential and unauthorized information to third parties. And uh, Getty also wants to be ready um, to be able to resolve any legal matters or litigation that comes up. So we need to you know, know where those records are. So how do we achieve um, all of these? We use the Getty Information Management Schedule uh, we also refer to this as an IMS, and you might also be familiar with this kind of document as a uh, records management schedule. So this document, uh, it's also a policy document, and it tells us what we need to look for, uh, what we need to do with it, and um, how we're going to um, disposition it, meaning what is kind of, are we going to put it into archives, or are we going to just, can we destroy it? So uh, our very first schedule was issued way back in 2006. Uh, this is our the cover of our current version um, that was approved by our general counsel in 2021. We review and update it every two years, and we do that in conjunction with departments. Uh, we get out there and talk to them about uh, their records, see if anything new has come up, um, and how we can tweak the schedule to best reflect um, what they are creating on the ground. So go, going back to the document, it tells us all the categories of um, information that we have uh, across the organization, the length of time to keep the information in those categories. Uh, and this can also include putting things into storage when um, they're no longer needed for everyday use, but 
we're not going to get rid of them just yet. They're sort of going to sit and wait out um, a time period till we review them for their disposition. So this document is available across the institution to everybody, all staff, so that everybody is aware um, how they're going to handle their records and information. And every once in a while, you know, we get some staff that insist that they don't have any records, they don't create records, they don't have any information that is um, applicable to the schedule. But um, that's not true. Every single department at the Getty creates records. Um, you know, some of them have a very small amount that are gonna be eligible for archives um, and a lot that can be destroyed. Some have, you know, the majority of what they're creating is going to be archives. It, it just sort of all depends on what the particular records and information they are creating are. So this is a peek inside the schedule. On the right-hand side, uh, that this is our table of contents. There's 21 different categories here. And um, for those of you who are information management practitioners, uh, the term category, which we use just for ease of use, um, that is sometimes referred uh, to also as a record title or, or just a title. It's, it's all the same thing. So each of these categories um, is a function. They're not specific departments. Uh, so, for example, um, we have a museum registrar and a research library registrar, and both of them have collections acquisitions material. So uh, it doesn't matter what department you're from, you know, if, if you're creating records applicable to a function, you can choose the category that, that they go in here. So each category contains subcategories. Uh, and these are sometimes referred to as series. Uh, subcategories are going to describe and classify uh, these information types in more detail. And here's an example of, um, of a category, collection acquisitions. And below this are the subcategories that sort of more granularly break down uh, what is included in this bucket. And you can see uh, there's the name of subcategories, for example, collection acquisition files, art and special collections. There's a brief description of what we're looking for in that category. There's a category code, CA100, that's just our administrative shorthand. Um, and then you'll see on the, on the very right hand side, it says permanent and then permanent and CY plus 10 years slash arc rev. Um, that is our designation that's going to tell us, um, do we look at this for archives? So in the case of these two permanent, it's like there's no question. We're just going to take it. We want to have this in, in archives. Something like the CY plus 10 years slash arc rev. Uh, CY stands for calendar year and plus 10 means that um, once it doesn't have any active business use, you want to hang on to it for, for 10 years. Um, and then we're going to pull it out of storage or wherever it is and look at it, um, appraise the records, and then send what we want to archives. The reason we put this arc rev review is we're pretty certain we're going to want these records, but we just want to review it just to make sure if there's things in there that that we don't want, and those we can just um, we can just send on their merry way to uh, destruction. So here's just a couple more examples of these categories uh, and subcategories that we are looking at collect to collect for archives. You can see there's like a whole range of we're interested in everything. We're interested in administration. We're interested in development, we're interested in exhibitions, we're interested in research activities and support, we're interested in documenting every single function that every department undertakes at the Getty. So when, we're, uh, when time comes to appraise these records, then it is disposition time. And these are the two routes that materials can take. On the left-hand side are our shred piles. Uh, and this is where materials for destruction end up. We pack them up in these boxes, uh, put them, and we stage them here in this area in our um, warehouse, uh, offsite warehouse. 
uh, and we just collect enough until we have a certain amount and then we just call our shred vendor to come pick it up they take it away and they securely shred it and then provide us with documentation that that job has been done on the right hand side uh, are where uh, the archival records end up uh, and this is just a picture of one of our ranges in our warehouse you can see there's um, lots of Hollinger boxes there and there are also uh, some record storage boxes and those are collections that uh, haven't been rehoused yet and they are awaiting um, awaiting to be rehoused. So um, now I just want to talk about uh, our department a little bit. Uh, so Institutional Records and Archives is administratively located in the Research Institute, as I mentioned um, a couple times um, in a couple slides ago. The Research Institute is this building on the left, this um, sort of round, it's kind of a C-shaped building if you look at it from the top. But we are working across the organization in every single department um, in the entire institution. And here you see this, this is an aerial view of, the, of all of the Getty Center. Well, it's obviously not the villa. We, um, we also collect records from the villa as well, but this is, this is our primary site, the Getty Center. We work with every single department. To optimize our outreach, uh, we employ what we call the liaison model. And um, this means that one staff is assigned to each program. And that staff looks after all of the information management and archives needs for every department in that program. So it's, um, it's kind of like um, each program has their, has their own archival consultant. So this chart here, um, it lists out all of the five, um, four programs plus trust administration. And underneath is an example of some of the departments um, that a liaison would be responsible for. It's, um, it's not inclusive, I couldn't fit all of them, but uh, this is just a sample. So I am the trust liaison. So I work with trust administration departments. So I am responsible for things like board of trustee records, president's office, um, the vice presidents, general counsel, and all of these administrative functions there. And my colleagues each have um, take one of these programs and they're doing the same functional work that I am just with uh, these different programs. So our job. So um, our one of our primary um, duties is to undertake records appraisal for review, classification, disposition, destruction, and or transfer to institutional archives. And this is where the information management schedule uh, really comes in. We always use the schedule to inform our decisions about how we're going to handle uh, records and information once it's active and its semi-active lives in storage are over. So where do we find these records? Uh, one place is in offices where um, we are called to go in and clear out file cabinets and box up materials and take them away. So um, these photos here are an example of a recent project I completed in our communications department. So uh, what I did is on the, the um, image on the left-hand side is a uh, file bank in their department, lateral file cabinet bank. Um, and it, all of these contain records. They contain um, records of their vice president, um, administrative records, public relation records, like all kinds of stuff in here. Um, so I reviewed and cleared out all of the contents that were in here, took them back and you know boxed them up and sent them um, out there. Well, obviously I didn't process them all yet. They're sort of sitting uh, awaiting next, next steps. I've accessioned everything at this point though. So, so that, that was a, a good step forward. So these photos are pictures of sort of what I found and it's kind of in general, this is, this is what you would encounter if you go and you look in uh, department file cabinets. Um, let's picture their file drawer. Um, everybody loves hanging folders, so there's a ton of hanging folders. Um, 
with the uh, tabs on them. The tabs are great. Um, what we do is we remove contents um, and we stape we um, we take the tabs and we staple them onto a folder. You know, it's it hasn't been re rehoused yet into archival folders, but we staple them on so we can retain all of this great information that people have in their file cabinets. Um, these other photos are just showing. Um, a um, a folder, and um, I believe those are those are actually um, groupings of clippings that have been stuffed into a um, accordion file. Um, below that are some CDs and um, other types of media to be reviewed, and then that final picture on the right hand side is just an overstuffed folder. So, um, yep, you can find all kinds of stuff when you go and look in people's drawers. Some people are super organized and some are not. So um, there you go with that. So where else do we find records? Um, I mentioned electronic records earlier. Um, right now, our primary um, areas to find electronic records are on the web and also on network drives. Um, we recognize that electronic records also exist in enterprise systems and also in email, uh, but we really don't have any way to um, get to those records right now and a place to, to adequately store them. So um, we recognize they're there, but we're not really dealing with those yet. So um, network drives um, is a primary place for to find Getty records and information. So this is uh, the shared drive of uh, Institutional Records and Archives Department. Um, and it's organized according to IMS categories. So we can easily just go in there and, um, you know, file stuff according to its function. And then we know when we can disposition it. So it's easy peasy. Uh, we encourage departments to organize their files like this. Um, there's varying degrees of, of success, uh, but you know we do what we can. Um, and it's pretty time intensive to do this. Right now it's a completely manual process, which is you know slow going if we go at all. Um, but we are in the process of procuring an electronic records management system. And this is going to enable a much greater information transparency across the entire Getty network. And it's going to enable us to disposition um, records without um, having, and users don't have to do anything. We can, we can just do it in the background, which we are really looking forward to that. So one other place we find records are in is in our record center, which is a storage facility for paper materials that have not met retention. They are still, but they are still considered inactive records. And we run the storage facility in our uh, warehouse annex. Um, it's right across the aisle from um, our, our archival institutional archives ranges. And we formally manage all of these records um, we categorize them uh, and then we inform the owners when the, all of these boxes are ready for disposition and we review. Then we pull them out of storage and we can appraise them uh, according to whatever their categories are. So this is what we do. Once materials are transferred to institutional archives, we make them as accessible as possible, um, given all of the access restrictions that we, um, we need to follow. So uh, the images here are from one of my very favorite collections. Uh, this is the Communications Department Press Relations and Public Outreach Collection. It is an open collection that anybody can look at. And it dates back to the museum's inception in 1954. So um, besides basic press releases, um, it includes press kits, which were until very recently, they were published um, as these very beautiful full color portfolios that you see in the far left image here. And these uh, were given out um, to journalists and uh, others who uh, attended um, exhibition previews and openings. And they were also given out for um, other public relations reasons as well. 
So um, the second photo down here at the bottom, um, this is the Getty Center 1997 opening uh, press kit. And it's kind of neat because it was housed in this tote bag with a logo on it. And you can see around it some of the, the items that were contained in that. So uh, the center image is the uh, current finding aid for this collection. And on the right hand side um, are some um, banners that are used to advertise exhibitions and um, also other initiatives. This is something that we collect as well as part of um, this public, re public relations and public, uh, um, public, excuse me, press releases and public outreach materials. That's it. Um, so these banners are, um, they appear on street signs like street lights uh, just around Los Angeles to advertise exhibitions. And there is also, there are also banners that appear on site to um, direct, direct visitors to exhibitions and uh, just general signage. So um, this is just some of my other favorite materials. Um, and these are from the facilities division. And the image on the left here are uh, the original Getty Center wall paint color samples. Um, and this book and these sample, samples uh, chips were put together um, and approved by Richard Meyer and partners, the architects, uh, for all of the interior walls at the Getty Center. Um, and this is also the center and it's also uh, in the parking structure. Um, you probably, um, each, each level in the parking structure is, is a different color, which I love because um, that's how I can remember where I parked and I remember the color. So uh, I really love this uh, because before I obtained this, I never really paid attention at all to what color the walls were. It was just everything is Meyer white, Meyer white. Um, then I obtained this started looking through it and it really opened my eyes and I suddenly was observing all of the walls and like oh my gosh these are all different colors and they are all represented in this book here so I think this is just really really kind of neat and on the right hand side is a very very small portion of Getty Center architectural and construction plans um, and this is this is just a this is a huge collection. It's like over 1800 feet. Um, most of it is rolled into tubes like this and we store them in cubbies. Um, we do, there are some flat files for the, um, what we know are sort of the most important and the most requested document um, plans, but most of it is uh, just like this for right now in these little cubbies. And these are just uh, a few more images of our archival storage facilities. On the right-hand side, you can see some flat files. Um, those are some tube boxes up there. Um, that's what I store the banners in. I roll, I, um, roll the banners up and store them in, in those uh, containers there. And then on the left-hand side is uh, just another picture of one of our ranges with um, Hollinger boxes and record storage boxes. So, um, so there's a couple more um, jobs that we are tasked with in our department. So um, we work we work extensively with our users in the programs, and um, I really cannot stress how vitally important this component is uh, because having success in this area is what's going to drive compliance with the information government's policies that we have. And it's also ultimately going to bring materials into the institutional archives um, because you have a relationship with the records creators and they're going to tell you about their records and they're going to want to put them in institutional archives. So um, having said that, we have formal and informal strategies for doing this, um, this outreach work with staff. So the formal is the official policy, uh, what's written down and codified as the information governance policy and the information management schedule. These are of course helpful because we have like a written, it's basically, it's our collection policy and it's how we go about doing it. Um, and it's approved by general counsel. So in that respect, um, you know, it's been endorsed and we have a 
official mandate from um, senior staff to be doing what we're doing. So there's like the stamp of approval on it. Um, so the informal consists of building relationships with all of our constituent programs, um, gaining their trust and demonstrating to them the value of institutional archives. And all of this work is done at a personal level um, and honestly, it, it takes a couple years, you know, because you really have to be, have to get in there and be really, you have to see people, you have to get out there, you have to work with them. Um, so both of these strategies, they go hand in hand, but um, you really need both, both to be successful. Um, and a couple years ago, I wrote a short article with my colleagues um, where we talked about this topic. And I just pulled out a quote from that article, which I really think kind of sums it up. Um, here it is on the right-hand side. We can document procedures and policies, but it's also about managing the habits, expectations, and limitations of users. Social skills are essential for performing the functions integral to institutional records and archives. Using them effectively is necessary for success. So finally, um, well, actually, penultimate, um, we're responsible for creating documentation, both for our own internal use, uh, for our users, and um, up, we, we have to keep up, we have to manage our policies as well. And finally, um, the final part of our job is to share our knowledge of our organization across the trust amongst staff with our professional colleagues and also with, with the public, um, which is what I'm doing tonight. I'm sharing my knowledge of my institution with all of you. And with that, I hope this talk was informative and you were able to learn about something about our Getty Institutional Archives. And I want to thank you all very much for inviting me to come and speak to you today on a Wednesday evening. And um, I am happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so it looks like it's about 7, 19 p.m. And we're gonna get to as many questions as we can until about 7.30. Um, so, it looks like the first question here is from Emily, and that is which MLIS classes have been most useful to you in your career? The most useful? Um, well, I really, I really um, thought the EAD class was very useful um, because that gave me concentrated time to actually sit down and learn this skill that I needed to have. Um, so that was a great class. Um, I also took a, um, a web design class as well. And again, that was also great because it gave me um, time to learn a skill that I needed. Um, other classes uh, I took, I was able to uh, familiarize myself with um, areas of practice that weren't archives related or records management related, um, such as um, like cataloging and um, other areas. And that was useful because it gave me insight, not, not that I was ever going to go and practice cataloging since I'm firmly ensconced in being an archivist, but it really gave me insight into what my colleagues uh, were doing because we have a bunch of catalogers um, in the library where I work. So uh, in that sense, I was able to better understand what, what they were doing. Um, I was also, to, I also took several classes where I was able to expand on um, knowledge that I was already building and gaining in my practical work experience. Um, like I, I took a class on electronic records, which is really great. Um, I got to, again, take additional time to devote to studying that. Um, and I also took uh, an archives class um, where I had this 
formal, I, I was able to formally learn how to construct a finding aid um, because up until that period, it was just sort of what I was learning on the job. So um, yeah, I think those were my most helpful classes. Great, thank you. And uh, so the next question is from Daniela and it's, have you digitized the archives completely or are there still <laughs> microfilm slides, tapes and other media? There is, I'd say the majority of our collection is not digitized. Um, our uh, procedure for um, how we're going to digitize is basically um, what what is what is what is somebody asking for, and if it's something that needs to be reformatted in a way that makes it easy for us to just pull it out and say, okay, let's digitize this. That's kind of how we're doing it. Um, Recently, a couple months ago, um, my supervisor was able to get a massive grant. Um, a massive grant is, um, that is money that the president's office um, puts aside and it's for special projects within the Getty. And she obtained this grant um, to digitize a bunch of our audiovisual materials. So um, that has been an ongoing project. I'm, am, I'm not involved in that. Um, but that's going to be pretty exciting. That is going to um, really open up um, the materials that are that we're going to be able to make available and um, that users can actually use rather than having them sit around on you know some beta tape that that nobody can access. So yeah, it's an ongoing process. Uh, righty. And so the next question is from Barbara. What is the most challenging aspect of your job? What is the most exciting, enjoyable? Um, I'd say that people and people <laughs> for both of those. Um, the challenging aspect um, is basically having to sell yourself and convince people that institutional archives and records and information management is something worthwhile that they should be doing. Um, I mentioned earlier that, yeah, we have this mandate from general counsel and they've endorsed us. Um, yes, but it's not something that's like, you know, oh, we get out there and like, you know, you must obey because general counsel says so. It's, we have to convince people. Um, and, I've been at Getty long enough now that I've sort of reached a point where um, I feel like I've done that now. Um, but it was a really a process of banging on people's doors for many, many years. And there's different levels of um, re receptivity to this. Some people are just like, oh, forget it. Some people are really interested, but it's just a process of constantly, you know, going out there and putting yourself out there and trying to make yourself available to people and sort of get them in your column. So on the flip side, when that does happen, that's really great because then you've built that relationship and you can rely on those people. And it's really easy just to have discussions about records and you know when you're gonna transfer this or, oh, come over and look at this. Um, so that's really great. So it's, it's people and people. <laughs> And so the next question is from Ashley. I'm a Getty employee on one of the diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion BE AI task force. Is your department planning of including DE AI works in the archives? Um, that's a great question. Um, right now, uh, we are just starting um, to look at how we can um, involve ourselves in that. A, a couple of my colleagues are on a group that is reviewing finding aids um, for language. Um, and when one of ours is found, that sort of comes back to us for corrections. I know that's, that's not including materials in the archives. Um, we do have um, some really interesting materials about 
DEI initiatives that took place back in the 90s. Um, and we have identified all of those materials and we've been sharing those with um, various stakeholders in the DEAI initiative. Um, and I think in the future, yes, we will be looking at um, how we can include other materials. Um, right now, it's very sort of um, executive function oriented which of course is only going to capture the more senior positions. Um, and I really hope that we can look at how we can, um, how we can capture records of um, staff at other levels of the organization as well. And um, one thing that I'm really uh, working on right now to get included into the archives are all of the um, community service events. Um, which in our community service uh, is a group of Getty um, colleagues who come together from across the organization to put together um, various um, initiatives like our biannual Getty art show and um, volunteer opportunities and um, uh, initiatives like that, which previously they were not collected. So I'm really excited to, to bring those in. But um, yes, definitely looking at how we can include all staff voices is something uh, that is on our agenda. Great. And the next question is from Robin. Are emails considered records that need to be archived? Does it depend on the email content? If so, how are they collected and preserved? Just curious because prior to email, it would have been more straightforward to collect records of correspondence. Right, right. So email today is the, the equivalent of memoranda, basically, um, and correspondence. So yes, it is considered records. Um, we don't have a method for extracting um, and preserving emails in C2 at this point. Um, we have managed to work with IT to um, preserve the email, the email accounts of certain individuals who have left the Getty, but they're just kind of sitting there and um, we don't have any kind of estimated time for when we might be able to to work with those. Um, in the meantime, if uh, we do need to collect emails, um, we PDF them. We just like PDF everything. Um, obviously, we can't PDF every single email. Um, the way we determine how uh, what we are going to save and what we want to archive is uh, we use this method um, that's based on um, that's based on function and position and um, it's the it's the uh, electronic um, email appraisal method that is used by NARA as well it's sort of like this bucket at the top is executives and then there's a the bucket below that is you know different types of, of program associates and then there's a bucket below that so um, yeah. It's, it's not terribly granular, it's more based on job function. Great. Um, so it, it looks like we could do one more question and then wrap it up given the time. So this question is from Lorena. It's how did COVID impact your ability to collect records? Did you find that this pushed the move to more digital and less paper keeping? paper record keeping? The, um, the pandemic work at home was actually really great um, because I had a ton of electronic records um, waiting for me to look at them. And by electronic records, um, I mean people's um, records that were harvested from shared drives. Uh, when people leave the Getty, um, it, it's policy to um, preserve their hard drives. And then those hard drives eventually, they end up with us. Uh, and then we have to review those. And I just had a backlog. Um, and, you know, if 
if a file cabinet can be a mess, it's like someone's shared, someone's um, file share, someone's hard drive can just completely be like, the wild west. Um, they're so hard. To, you, you really need a lot of time to go through everything and look at what they have in there. So I was able to really clear out the backlog and I was actually able to um, complete a couple of finding aids uh, that were based on these electronic records. So um, that was great. That was actually the blessing in disguise of working at home. But then on the flip side, you know, I came back and it's like, Oh, what's that pile over there? What's that pile? Oh, yeah, that's something I picked up from somebody, you know, to a session right before we shut down. So, I mean, there's it, it's coming up. It's coming from both directions. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We, we all thank you for your time and your information and your presentation tonight. Yes, you're welcome. And I wish all of you success in your program. Great, Thank so, you. yeah. And so one last announcement is the next presentation like this will be December 7th, and that's with another alumni from SJSU, from the University of Nevada, the head of special collections and archives department. And it's gonna be 6.30 or seven, like usual, and that's gonna be uh, announced in the, on the website and with the Canvas announcement. Great, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, again, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation and I'm sure everybody did as well. Um, yeah, thank you everybody. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you next time. All right, thank you so much.